Hello, everybody. Welcome to the third episode of Occupy Western North Carolina Report, live every first Tuesday of the month at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. My name is Anne, and with us today is Doreen from the Philip Price election campaign. He is running to be our representative for District 11, <laughs> which I'm very proud that our um, Doreen, am I saying it right? Yes, yes. Could come Doreen. and be with us today. And Diane, also from Occupy, and we're going to kind of gang up on you and ask you <laughs> these okay. very important questions. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. The first question I have is, what is Philip Price's intention concerning H.R. 676, which is John Conyers of Michigan's bill to pass Medicare for all? Philip Price likes this bill a lot. Um, it's sort of a dream bill. It's got a great um, transition funding for people who are working in the um, health care industry right now. It transitions them into training, into uh, being part of the public system. It's a little ambitious, he thinks. He wonders if it can happen in a year from the time the bill passes to the time a full transition would take place would be one year in the bill. And so it took four years for the Affordable Care Act to roll out. So, um, so he's wondering about that, how ambitious that might be. Um, but he likes so many things about this bill. One of the things he, there's two things that he would question that aren't, that aren't answered in the bill. But I think when it goes through committee and it goes forward, those things would be answered. But it puts a small progressive tax on unearned income. And so he, his question would be how small and at what dollar amount would that tax take place if somebody's uh, retired and living on unearned income at 12000 a year, would there be a small tax on that person or what dollar amount would that start? Um, also, this bill put, puts, um, there's a director of the whole program and then there are regional directors. And all of those directors are political appointees. So he's a little bit, uh, Phil Price is a little bit concerned uh, that there might be a political mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, a component to every four years or eight years new people and yeah. new politics. So he would have a little bit of concern about that. But basically, he's very much in favor of this bill. And Phil Price would want people to know that there's no reason to wait for a perfect bill. If this bill can get passed in one fell swoop, that would be wonderful. But in lieu of that, he there's a lot of things that he thinks that can be done to get move us more toward that place. He is um, passionate about um, the ACA and stabilizing the exchanges on the ACA. Um, right now, there's a bipartisan committee, the HELP Committee. Um, and there's a lot of bipartisan support for um, a re the, there's a reimbursement part of the ACA that a reinsurance part CSR payments that are made to insurance companies when they waive deductibles and copays for low income people and right now those payments are made by the president and they're made on a monthly basis and they're constantly being threatened not to be made so this is one of the number one reasons insurance companies say that they pull out of the exchanges and that they raise premiums is that they can't plan for the future if they don't know those payments are going to be made. The health committee, it looks like they're coming up with some ideas like switching that from a, pr a presidential responsibility to a congressional responsibility and that those payments would be made by Congress and they would be made yearly. That would have yeah. the impact of stabilizing the exchanges literally overnight. If that bill's passed, the next day those exchanges would be stabilized because insurance companies would be able to look forward mm -hmm. at what their costs mm -hmm. will be. Um, Expansion of Medicaid? I'm sorry? Expansion of Medicaid? He, he would love that. That wouldn't come under his purview in Congress because that's a state by oh, state. Okay. But he is concerned that we have 500,000 people in North Carolina that are in the Medicaid gap. And we're not um, taking advantage of that right, right. now. Right, and because we paid our federal dollars, but those federal dollars are going to Ohio to mm -hmm. pay for their Medicaid mm -hmm. expansion, and, and not ours, and our neighbors are suffering. Mm -hmm. So, um, so he, Phil Price, 
would have everybody know that there are 44,512 people in District 11 that get their insurance through the Affordable Care Act. And he's one of them. He's a small business owner. He knows what it's like to raise a family without health insurance. Ten years they went without health mm -hmm. insurance. Um, no candidate, nobody is more passionate about saving the ACA and about health care than Philip Price is. It's a number one priority for him. And, and you know, he would... He would, ex he would be supportive of any plan or any idea that moves us toward getting health care off an employer-based system into a public system, including being, you know, passing an amendment that would allow Medicare to um, negotiate with drug companies and bring down drug prices and to ship in um, cheaper drugs from overseas. These are all things that would move us closer. You know, he agrees with Bernie Sanders when this Sunday on TV, Bernie was talking about a Medicare for anyone who wants it option. Putting in a public option, if we can't get the full thing done all at once, then Medicare should be available to whoever wants to buy into that program. Mm -hmm. um, these are all things that could move us closer. And, and there are other ideas, and he would be supportive of any idea. Yeah. Uh, you know, he, he he's been crisscrossing around the, the 11th district for six months now. Mm -hmm. He He's been in, he's been here, living here for over 30 years. He's lived in six of the counties here, and he knows the people here. He knows what's important to them, and what they're telling him is that jobs in the economy are important to them. And Philip Price is so good at explaining to people who are worried about wages and worried about jobs, when you take that huge expense off the backs of employers and you move that program to a public program, that's a lot of money. That is a big burden employers have been um, burdened with. That's a lot of money that could be freed up to raise wages and to increase jobs. Um, so when people think, well, my boss pays for, you know, 75% of my premium, I get my health care through my insurance, when premiums go up, which they always have, the worker might not see that a lot. A couple dollars here and there comes out of the paycheck. The employer sees it a lot. And people who think that the employer is paying for the premium, no. You're paying for that premium in the form of stagnant wages. You want wages to go up. You want jobs to come. We've got to change our health care system. Good. Um, HR 232366 talks about um, student loans. And uh, students are graduating now with thousands of dollars of loans. And most of them, a lot of them, go into very low-paying jobs, if any at all. And um, would you explain a little bit uh, how this law would help the students in um, when the, the, the loan becomes unmanageable? Well, Philip Price's idea, it, it, and this is a, a two- or three-fold thing, but... Um, this is, right now, if somebody files uh, Chapter 11 bankruptcy, they cannot discharge their student loan with the rest of the, their loans in that bankruptcy. Um, this bill would allow them to do that. Um, nobody wants to file bankruptcy, but if you have to, why would a student loan be treated any differently? Sorry. So he's in support of doing that, but he understands also that if you, if you can discharge a student loan in a bankruptcy, it will make those student loans a little bit harder to get. Um, lenders are going to start treating student loans the way they treat personal loans and other loans. Mm -hmm. So it's a double-edged sword. It could make it a little bit hard to get those. But what he would propose, um, he would love to see tuition-free community college. He, Bill Price understands that when we pay for education, we get that, that student out into the workplace quicker, and they become taxpayers quicker. We make that money back. When, we have, when people have an education, they make higher wages than people without an education in general. There are mm -hmm. always, you know, there are exceptions to that. So when they're paying higher wages, they're paying more taxes. Those taxes become a revenue stream that we can use for, me for medical care. We can use that for um, then offering tuition-free four-year schools. The more we pay, other countries know this, the more we pay into education, that money comes back to us very quickly and produces a lifelong revenue stream from mm -hmm. that person with the degree. Mm -hmm. um, he really likes seeing a public-private um, partnership with community colleges 
A good example is what's happening with Delta Airlines. Delta realized that they were not able to hire people who had the skills they needed. They needed aircraft mechanics. So they had people coming out of two-year schools with the mechanical abilities and people coming out of four-year schools with uh, computer tech abilities, but they needed one person at both. They have partnered with 47 community colleges around the United States, from Lansing, Michigan to Everett, Washington, um, and Delta has created the curriculum, exactly the classes they need these people mm -hmm. to take, and, um, and provided some of the instruction. They bring in an airplane, they <laughs> teach these people exactly what they need to know. They're not taking classes they don't need. They're guaranteed a job, 50000 a year to start, 100000 after five years. These are good, solid, middle-class jobs. Um, if we can handle our education correctly, we can increase wages and job growth. Um, we, Philip Price is worried that we, this trend that people have to have a four-year degree just to enter the middle class. And like you said, Diane, they're entering the middle class but making the same or less than their parents made who didn't have a four-year degree. Mm -hmm. And all that time, we're not, they're delaying becoming taxpayers while yeah. they're in school. Yeah, yeah. Um, that also applies from what I understand to other laborers or mechanics or whatever, because right now they don't even have enough carpenters to build the houses that have been destroyed in the hurricane. And you could start off with pretty good pay. Anyway, that was my own little input. <laughs> Next question? You ready? Uh -huh. <laughs> Okay, what does Price think about HJR resolution, the We the People campaign? Uh, the We the People campaign is one that he's in favor of. It really states that um, corporations are it, it that corporations aren't people. It's saying that corporations do not de deserve to have um, all of the <coughs> constitutional rights that people have. Um, Philip Price <coughs> believes that people sneeze and corporations don't, so they're not people. People bleed, people laugh, people cry. Corporations don't do those things. To give a corporation the same constitutional rights as people um, doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense, and it hasn't it ha it doesn't seem to have improved anything. I think a lot of people complain about the money in politics. A lot of people complain about <coughs> not being represented. Co corporations are getting represented because they can buy their representation. People can't buy their representation necessarily as easily. Not most people. And so there's a skew in how we're being represented. And Bill Price is not running for Congress to represent corporations. He doesn't plan on taking money from corporations, any donations from corporations. He, he takes... That would have been my next question. I know. Very good. Sorry about that. No, it's fine. He, he's running for Congress to represent people, and he will take um, donations from people. But not corporations. He's not, gonna, he's not representing them. Okay, are you ready for the next question? I that, think you answered that one. <laughs> um, Tulsi Gabbard, whom we all know, is a representative in the United States Congress, and she has introduced an act called Off Fossil Fuels, the Off Act. And it states that, according to the bill, that we would be off, as a country, off fossil fuels by 2035. And also, 80% of that would be accomplished by 2027. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. And how does Philip Price feel about that? Philip <laughs> Price is an environmentalist. Yay. So him and his wife are both environmentalists. He runs a small business reclaiming old wood. He has saved millions and millions of board feet of, board feet of wood from winding up in landfills and deteriorating on the ground. He makes b beautiful things for home building and home remodeling, and he makes furniture and exposed beams, countertops, all that stuff. So he's an environmentalist that has been in the business of saving wood. This, this off act is, um, is very exciting to him because it's so possible. There is no... Um, Did you say so possible? So possible. <laughs> this is something that can absolutely be done. It, Bill Price would like everybody to realize that North Carolina is number two in solar energy in the United States, only behind California. Wow. We have well over 33,000, no, 35,000 
full-time jobs in renewable energy in North Carolina. These are good middle-class jobs. We need to keep going in that direction. Phil Price is very excited about North Carolina and where we're going in that direction and wants, the, wants to continue having North Carolina be one of the leaders. Um, we've got over 6,000 and something um, renewable energy systems in North Carolina. That's really, really exciting. That is so exciting. <laughs> when people think, oh, we're going to get off fossil fuels by 2035, um, that is more doable than people think. The only thing stopping that are the fossil, the fossil fuel industry. <clears throat> um, but the, the jobs are there. They're good paying jobs. We need to continue in that direction. Um, he, he is very, very supportive of a strong EPA. Philip Price I, uses the example. For those of us old enough to remember, but some of your listeners might not be old enough to remember, but just could imagine sitting in a small no-smoking section on an airplane. You can't open a window. The, the smoke in aisle 10 is going to affect the, the person in aisle 20. Um, that's what happens if we weaken the EPA. If we say the EPA um, should be small and then we leave it up to each state to develop their own environmental regulations, that's crazy. It, when John Kasich rolls back environmental uh, regulations in Ohio, that pollution floats east. It doesn't float past us. It gets stuck in our mountains and it impacts our ecosystems. Um, you know, pollution, air pollution, water pollution, the rivers and streams, it doesn't stop at the state line. No. We impact each other. It doesn't even stop at a country line. We, we the globe is like the airplane. <laughs> pollution mm -hmm. is going to affect everybody on the globe. It already is and already does, and we know that. Um, but he is very supportive of a very strong EPA. If we let states do it on their own, they will be incentivized, incentivized to get rid of their, get to lower their state, their environmental standards in order to attract business because it's cheaper than for business to do business there, which then incentivizes all the other states around them to do the same. So we have this very quick race to the bottom. Um, and can so quickly, very quickly, undo all the progress that we've made yes. toward clean, yes. uh, clean energy and a clean environment. When I was young, the Ohio River actually caught fire. Yes. And yes. you could not I'm swim in the that. Delaware River. Right. So, yes, you're very right. So he's very concerned about the EPA, about those regulations, about avoiding a race to the bottom environmentally. Um, and he, he is... He loves Western North Carolina. He's been here forever, well, for a long time. Good. And he knows that our um, jobs and our um, our jobs and our job growth relies on tourism, and that our tourism relies on our clean air. People come here to hike our mountains, breathe our clean exactly. air, sh hunt and fish in our rivers and streams, and they come here and they fall in love and they build a vacation home, or they move here and build a home. Our construction agents, our construction industry in the 11th district relies on tourism that relies on clean, a clean environment. Yes. And so if the people who want more jobs and better pay um, need to understand how it's all connected and that we, we get that by protecting our environment here. Yes, <sighs> very, very Boy, good. Boy, good explanation <laughs> too. That's a good answer. Are you um, ready for the next question? <laughs> he is. You, this is you are great at, at explaining this. Would you, before you continue, explain that um, all the candidates were invited? They weren't. We're going to do separate shows for each of the, the, uh, of the different candidates. This is the Philip Price campaign report for Occupy Western North Carolina. But thank you. <laughs> okay. Remind us, yeah. Um, there's been a lot of talk about election fraud. Uh, we've seen the possibility of maybe hacking into our, com our computers and changing the results. Um, we're not counting all votes in some situations. And the polls are either closing early or they're being removed from a neighborhood totally. How does he feel about uh, that particular issue of election fraud and how can we resolve that problem? Not uh, voter fraud, election fraud. Election fraud. Big fraud. Difference. Yeah. Right. Voter fraud and election fraud. Voter fraud, we don't have much evidence that voter fraud happens at right. all. We've got a Congress that are 
spending lots of taxpayer money right now on a looking, I mean, we've got to sol trying to find solutions for a problem that doesn't really exist. But election fraud is something that um, I, I haven't specifically talked to Philip Price about what he would do in a case where if he were running and he lost by a, a small margin and there was evidence that election fraud had happened, um, my best guess would be that he would say that he would fight it, that he would ask for a recount and he would, he would fight it. I haven't specifically talked to him about that. I know that he's very, very concerned about voter suppression, which is what um, mm -hmm. you so much fraud, yes. pointed to, is yeah. uh, suppressing the vote, um, shutting down polling places so that people have to drive further to get to the polls. These are happening in places where it's harder for people to get to the polls. People it's, don't that's drive. That's a whole other topic. Yeah, yeah. But he's very concerned about voter suppression mm -hmm. and um, would like to and would definitely be fighting that when he gets to Washington. Mm -hmm. But but I would have to ask him when he comes here to talk to you. He's gonna. He's going to be able to say all this a lot better okay. than I can. So. Oh, you're yeah. doing great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're doing great. You're doing really great. Yeah. Um, we have had a lot of people talking about changing a little bit our voting system, which is called ranked choice voting. Mm -hmm. And this opens up our voting possibilities extensively to mm -hmm. be a little more fair, what would he, uh, would he agree with this, or? He would love this. Philip Price would love this. He, he loves, um, he, he supports things that give Americans more choice, first of all. And this does give Americans more choice, because it's not just a binary choice. When people rank each candidate based on their number one choice, number two choice, number three, number four, depending on how many candidates and what kind of race it is, um, this really is something that is very doable, that there's bipartisan support for, that we can um, that we can get past, I think Phil Price thinks very quickly, um, because it really helps to mitigate the problems associated with dark money in politics. People are less likely to want to give millions and millions and millions to a candidate when it's not one or the other. They're, mm -hmm. they're going to give the same mm -hmm. amount to the number two choice? Like, mm -hmm. it would be just, wait. You know, just so, I'm, I'm going to interrupt and, and maybe ask for a short explanation of what ranked choice voting even is, because I think maybe some of our listeners might not know what that is. And I know, and okay. Diane knows, and you know. <laughs> Help me explain it then, because it's, okay. I, I understand it's harder to explain, but you would rank your can. Let's say you have three candidates. You rank them, your number one choice, number two choice, number three choice. The voter does this? The voter does at this. At the polls. At, at the, the polls. same day. On the same day. So you go and you vote. You, in other words, there's three candidates and you rank them. Yes. Rather than just picking one. That's right. Okay. So you're, if so the person, if any of those people get over 50% of the vote, then they win the election. But let's say all three of them get, nobody gets 50%. The person who gets the least um, number one choice on their card, like they were picked least frequently for number one, that person would be eliminated. And all their number two choices would then be added to the other two candidates. Um, and then, so it continues an elimination process like that until Very one good. person has. Yeah. So that means it would not be a two-party system. It, it wouldn't be. This would be a system that would give, it's the only system really that I've heard of that Phil Price thinks would give a third-party candidate a real yes. good shot at getting elected. And it helps the gerrymandering problem. It, it does. It, it, it helps. Right now, if, if you vote for a third party, everybody accuses you of voting against the other person. That's right. A, par, a vote for this person is a vote for that person. You know, right. like, and, and with ranked choice voting, it wouldn't be that way. Um, you could really vote for a third party without that having an impact on one of the other mm -hmm. two major candidates. And, th and it would mitigate, um, not completely, but it would really lessen the impacts of gerrymandering. One of the big impacts of gerrymandering is that it causes the candidates to be more and more polarized. Mm -hmm. When they have a safe seat, the only um, competition to them is somebody in a primary from their own party. 
And so that pulls each party further to the right and further to the left. Right. And we get this real polarized thing where our candidates in Congress don't even represent the majority of us. Rather than being issues oriented and right. being money oriented. And just to yes. explain to people what gerrymandering is, is the uh, political pa uh, party that is in power at that time gets to draw the district. So they can draw the district to include more of the people that would vote for them and therefore have more districts that would be supporting one candidate, their party candidate. And, and this has gone on forever, but it's only recently that the, that the technology yes. has allowed gerrymandering to be so specific to literally, based on what you click on on, what, on your computer, what you watch on TV, they can pick out which voters are going to vote which way with oh, yeah. wow. very good accuracy. It's scary. And they will draw their districts. I mean, if you see some of the pictures of the districts, it's really crazy. The, the so right choice would mitigate some of those effects? Yes, yes. And how would it do that? Because everybody will have a number two choice. Ah, I see. So, and the number two choice mm -hmm. might win. Might win, the election. yeah. I get so it. we will. So with ranked choice voting, it's, it really increases the likelihood um, that the majority of people will be happy with the result. Right. That we will have, and so frequently now, and it's happening more and more often, um, that we are getting representatives who did not win the popular vote. Mm -hmm. uh, the House of Representatives in 2012, the first House of Representatives in 70 years, that the majority of the, won the majority of seats, but did not win the majority of votes. Mm -hmm. um, and we know the president elections that have happened. Um, and this is happening with more and more frequency. So wow. it's becoming a real problem. The Supreme Court is going to vote or be here, um, a ger some gerrymandering from mm -hmm. Wisconsin. That's not racial about racial gerrymandering. That's already illegal yeah. about um, political gerrymandering. Yeah. So it's going to be oh, very, good, very interesting good. to watch what the Supreme Court says about this. Is that the state but or national federal? The, the Supreme Court, the federal. State, okay. The, oh, the federal. federal. Supreme Court. Well, it's federal. about Wisconsin. the state. Yes, yeah, it's about about Wisconsin, Wisconsin, but it's happening at the Supreme Court. Yes. Yeah. So, so that'll be, but we the people can redefine what it means to be a person. We can talk to our congressmen and talk to our representatives and look at that bill. We can look at the, the ranked choice voting and talk to our representatives and call people um, and say that we want, if we can't get rid of gerrymandering, if the Supreme Court doesn't help us out, and if we can't get rid of big dark money, if mm -hmm. Citizens United is going to like keep doing that, you know, cause that can't be fixed, then let's insist on ranked choice voting. It's right. happening in Minneapolis. They've been able to get rid of primaries. You know, oh, primaries. My next question is: Is this happening at the cost? And yes. it costs the states a lot to so do it. So it's already it. happening when, in municipalities? And municipalities are doing it. Lots of different places in California are doing it. All over the country, really, places are country. doing it. Wonderful. Because it saves so much money. Yeah. If you don't, like places where they have a separate runoff election, um, that's a whole other yeah. election you're paying saves for. Money. In primaries mm -hmm. that you're paying for. So it saves a lot of money to be able to do ranked choice voting and go to polls one time. Yeah. Okay, you got two minutes. Finish us out. Two minutes? Can you I just add hour? something? Well, right, right now, people can seconds. sign up for We the People. Oh, yes, that's yes. right. That's right. So they can go that's to right. wethepeople.org org and okay. North sign. North Carolina, wethepeople.org, and sign the North Carolina resolution. And so sign back it. To, back okay. to Price. Back to <laughs> Philip Price. I want to say, Philip Price is, I'm Thank so you. excited to represent him because he is innovative, he's forward thinking. He's, he's from the district, he knows what the people in the district care about, and he cares about them. And he can so eloquently explain to people how their concern for higher wages and their concern for jobs is, can be solved by solving the environmental mm -hmm. problems, by solving the health care problems, by looking at education and doing some innovative things there, the, and, 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 and the environment. And like these are all things, climate change, all of those problems can be... Um, attacked in an innovative way that brings up pay and brings better jobs to Western North Carolina. Clean, good, middle class jobs. Mm -hmm. We need our middle class back again. Yes, yes. yes we do. Thank you so much, Dory. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. That was our show for today, for October the 4th. That was the Occupy Western North Carolina report for October of 2017. Thank you so much for tuning in.